All right, here we are, finally. It is June 20th, 2016, and here we are again. It is the summer solstice, and we are here in class. So, here we are, first problem. Um, we have this uh, bar here. We have a simple structure here composed of a uh, L-shaped bracket with a roller support here and a pin support here. So, I am, and we are asked to determine the reactions at A and B when dimension A is 150 millimeters. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is label my unknown <coughs> reactions. So, let's do that. Uh, I'm going to have my reactions here. A Y. and AX. Then I'm going to have BX. So, can I do BX here? I'm going to just assume everything is moving to the uh, up and to the right. Simply, for the, uh, simply because I'm lazy and I like to just assume everything is up and to the right, and then if I get a negative number, I'm, I'll know it's pointing in the other direction. Okay. So where do we go from here? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for any easy points I can get on the board. And I see one. I see a very I, can, I see a thing here that I can do very quickly to get some easy points on the board. What I mean by that is I have three unknowns. I need to solve for these using some clever combination of solving forces in the x and y direction and some of moments, right? I need to do some combination of the above. So what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, first, so if we get any of them, it usually will make it easier to get other ones. So I'm going to start by just getting anything I can very easily. It's called just getting some sort of points on the board. So you know what? I look at this and I see, oh, if I had some forces in the vertical direction, I have only un one unknown force in the vertical direction. So I'm just going to say, okay, sum of forces in the y direction is equal to negative 320 newtons minus, oh, an A actually here, we're not solving for A, A is 150 millimeters here. 150 millimeters. Okay, negative 320 millimeter, or sorry, negative 320 newtons uh, plus AY equals zero, Therefore, this leads us to Ay is simply equal to 320 newtons. So we have our first reaction. We got some points on the board. Very easy, something to get. Now, what's next? Okay, what I'm going to look for next is I am going to look for, um, I'm going to ask myself, can I solve this using sum of forces, say, in the horizontal direction? Well, I can't. I can't. Eat, I cannot solve for forces in the horizontal direction, unfortunately, because what's going to happen is um, I'm going to have two unknowns if I do that. So I'm going to look. Instead, I'm going to look for some place to some moments about that will result in having only one unknown. And most likely, what that is going to mean is either points A or point B, either point A or point B. See, if I sum moments about point A. Um, now, I drew them below here, but in reality, AX acts right through the pin, AY acts right through the pin, right? They go right through the pin. So if, the, um, so if I have some moments about point A, this force here and this force here have no moment arm about that point. So therefore, they won't generate any moment about that point. I will not need to include them in the moment expression. <coughs> However, BX will and this 320 Newton force will. So. If I do a sum of moments about point A, that will allow me to get BX. If I do a sum of moments about point B, that will allow me to get AY. Oh. So uh, I think I'll just sum for mo solve for moments about point A. Sum of moments about point A, counterclockwise positive. I'm going to have 320 Newtons positive because it's because uh, it's uh, actually sorry negative because it's uh, clockwise about point a times uh, 0.15 meters 
minus bx times 0 0.08 meters equals 0. All right, and then um, let's see here. So bx is going to be equal to negative 320 times 0.15 over 0 0.08, which let me throw that into my calculator. So let's see, 320 times 0.15 over 0.08. I am getting uh, 600, negative 600 newtons. Negative 600 newtons. So we know that Bx is actually going to the left, which does make sense with what we see. Uh, so, uh, so it does make sense as drawn. I would expect this to actually... Um, I would expect the reaction to push this thing to the right. This, the wall can't actually pull the support to the right as drawn, so that's okay. So this is this is actually how I would expect it to be. But again, I made a blind assumption. I simply assumed that reactions were going up and to the right initially. All right, or 600 newtons left. And I could report this either way. Either way is fine. Okay. Mm. This is the reaction at B. Yes, this is BX. It is the reaction at B in the X direction. The question was, that's, is that the reaction at B? Yes, that is the reaction at B in the X direction. Huh? Yes, it's the only one. Yes, yes. You could also just call it a uh, B... Uh, reaction B or something like that, but by convention, I just like to call all reactions A, like joint number subscript. But that's personal preference. Then to get the other one, um, I only have one more unknown, so I can simply go, all right, sum of forces in the x direction is equal to AX uh, plus BX equals zero, AX equals negative BX which is equal to negative, negative 600 newtons, or positive 600 newtons, or AX equals 600 newtons to the right. I could also interpret this one as or AY equals 320 newtons upward. So basic, let's look at the system here. What's happening? The There is a vertical force here pushing down. This pin is carrying all of that vertical load, but then we still need to balance the moment caused by, because if we have a, um, okay, so this pin here, uh, so we have, basically I'm just reinterpreting this now. We have uh, this downward force here. This pin is carrying all of that, all of that vertical load. It's, care, it's keeping this thing from translating in the vertical direction. But then we'll have this upward force here and this downward force here. This is a couple. This is a couple, the upward component here and the downward component here. So we have a couple which would tend to cause rotation uh, if we didn't have these uh, X components here. So instead, what, what these X components are doing is they're not preventing the thing from translating. Rather, what they are doing is they're pr they are producing an opposing couple that will oppose the rotation that this couple composed of the vertical reaction here and the 320 newton force would want to cause otherwise. Questions on that? Okay, do you follow that? <laughs> well, that's much more simple than the uh, solution may you know? The solution may have disagrees with you that it has a tangent and has an angle to it. Oh, okay. The, uh, the, okay. The, the answer in these ans this answer was different in the solutions manual. Okay, what they did is they probably just combined these together. You can report reactions as a combined forces. If we wanted to, we could actually go and combine these together and say, oh, force A is on net this force acting at this angle, or you can just report them as x and y components. Either one is perfectly valid. Yeah, I think, I think if we both uh, saw it as a group of angles, like what we 
okay. Okay, that's one, that's another way to do it, yeah. I mean, you can interpret it different ways. I, I, I look at this, and it's pretty simple just to um, do some moments and get the forces that way. Um, if we wanted the combined reaction at A, we would use the, uh, if we wanted the combined, the question was, we should we combine the reactions at A? Well, we can if we wish, and we would just use vectors to combine them together. We have an X component, we have a Y component, we could find the combined force. Okay, that makes sense? Okay. Uh, what's next? Okay. All right, so for the frame and loading shown, determine the reactions at C and D. This is a fun one. So, do you remember when I said we could only solve for three reactions? What do we have here? We have four reactions. How is that going to work? Is this unsolvable? Have I lied to you? So yes, we clearly have these reactions here. Okay, here's what's happening. Now, yes, you can only solve for up to three forces on an object, um, but that's for a single object, for a single rigid body. Uh, but we do not have that here. We actually have two objects joined together at a pin. We have two independent objects here. So we will need to actually draw two free body diagrams and separate them out as such. So this is going to be a bit more complicated than the last one. So let's do that thing I said. So I'm going to draw out a free body diagram that will show um, all of this. So I'm going to have uh, these two objects here, like this. And we're going to have all my reactions here. Cy, Cx, Dx, dy, then here's where it gets fun, bx, bx, um, I need to draw compatible forces, by and by. So this is going to kind of go against my previous rule of just assuming everything up and to the right. And because uh, because fundamentally, I, when I am drawing forces, I need to make sure I'm drawing compatible forces. See, look here. I have my BX and my I have these two BXs. That is the, um, I'm assuming this one is moving it to the right and this one is moved to the left by that force. And then the by, I'm assuming this piece is pulled up by that force and this piece is pulled down by that force. I could assume the opposite, but these forces, the forces on each piece need to be equal and opposite. If I'm assuming this bx acting on the left one is to the, is to the right, then this one has to be to the left. If this bx is to the left, then this one has to be the right. It doesn't matter which way we assume, but we need to assume compatible um, forces. Forces occur in pairs. Now. Um, we could draw the same thing here. We could, I could show an equal and opposite CX and a CY, but it's reacting against the ground. We're not drawing a free body diagram of the entire Earth, so I don't need to worry about that. But here, when we have a system composed of multiple objects, we need to draw a, uh, a composite free body diagram showing all of the individual components. We need to break, uh, whenever you have a simple structure like this, you need to break it into pieces. And I like, I'm, I'm glad you uh, asked me to work through this problem because this gets very much into the method of joints which will, for trusses, which we'll be going over today. Okay, so there you go. That's set up. The rest is just math, right? The rest is just math. <laughs> so you're, you're, 
principle is that, is that we have two parts here because they're joined by that hinge and feed, mm -hmm. and you grew the two parts, and you're just breaking the simple structure into pieces. We're just breaking the simple structure into pieces, yes. <laughs> the hinge at B is another pin? Uh, yeah. Okay. The hinge at B is another pin, yes. How did you see that the first time? Okay, so how can we solve this? Well, what I'm going to do is, oh, okay, I'm always just looking for ways to get points on the board, right? So if I can get any of these, I'm going to be happy. So uh, what I'm going to do first of all is, um, well, let me just draw this first one out again separately. These, these are, this is a little crowded. Let me draw this out again separately because this is a little crowded. Should have probably drawn them bigger. 150 pounds. CX, CY, BX, BY. So we have, we may have to dance back and forth on this. Okay. What I do, do you see where I'm? Do you perhaps see what I'm thinking? Which one I'm gonna? Do you? Uh, which one am I gonna try to solve for first? There's one of these that really pops out is really different than the others. C, uh, huh? Which one? C Not CY. Moment about C CX. I'm going to try to get CX. Oh, yeah. Look at this. Look at point B. All of these other, well, I don't really care about this one because I know that one. But all, I have four unknowns drawn here. But um, this one, this one, and this one all have lines of action that pass through point B. But, but CX does not. So I'm going to do a sum of moments. Um, you know what, for clarity, I might call this object one and this one object two. And I'll just do like, say, object one about point B. So when I'm doing this, this will show object one about point B. So then I'm going to have, all right, I gotta ha I'm going to have 150 pounds. A positive moment times three feet. Uh, let's see then. Plus CX times three feet equals zero. Right? The perpendicular distance from each of these is three feet. So with CX, uh, if you solve for that, must be equal to negative 150 pounds. Or 150 pounds to the left. So we have the first reaction. We have this one. Now I can simply do, um, again, I have another opportunity to get points on the board. So I'm going to say, so I have this one here. I'm just going to do a sum of forces on object one in the x direction. Uh, that's going to give me bx plus CX equals zero. So therefore that will lead me to um, BX is negative CX or uh, let's see, uh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, negative, that's not C lambda, that's CX. Negative, negative 150 pounds or 150 pounds positive, or 150 pounds to the right. So that's CX, there, that's BX. This is CX. So I'm just gonna box this one. And I'm going to box this one. And we have this one, okay? So what's next, what's next, what's next? Well, I, uh, I think I'm done with object one for now. I don't think I can get more on that right as of yet. We'll come back to it, but I think we now need to move over to object two. So two, let me redraw that one. RBX and CX are a couple then? Um, let's see, RBX and CX a couple. Um, well, let's see. Yeah, they would be a couple, yes, they would be a couple, yes. 
if you want to interpret that way, but th th it's complicated by the fact that we have this 150 pound force here, so uh, maybe, depending. Uh, if we solved a moment about B, would we have just one unknown? Uh, actually, if we solved the moment about B, we would have zero unknowns, yeah, we do. Yeah. unfortunately. Um, let's see. Could that help? Yeah. Well, let's see. Could we get more with just that? Let's see. What if we solved for the moment about... You know, I'm going to see if we can get further than that. Let's see. Um, what if we solved for the moment about A? Would that help us? Would that help us? We have two. Unknowns. Yeah, never mind. We did, we still have by. Never mind. We're good. Or that's not going to help us. Yeah, the by and the problem is by and cy are the same line of action. There's no point that we can solve for a moment that will eliminate one but not the other. Okay, so I'm going to redraw object two again just for clarity. And notice what I'm doing here. I'm going to draw this again bx to the left. I'm ignoring what I've calculated previously. I know it's actually to the right, but I'm just drawing it to be compatible with uh, what I originally drew. And by downward. dx and dy like so. Okay, so I have bx here, which will mean that it's going to be very simple to get dx. So I'm just going to do the sum of forces on object 2 in the x direction. So I'm going to have dx minus bx equals 0. And notice I'm setting up my equations of equilibrium simply based off of this drawing. I'm, not, I'm completely ignoring the number that I've gotten here and just, uh, just following the drawing purely. And so then dx... Um, is going to be equal to bx or going to be equal to 150 pounds. So dx equals 150 pounds to the right. So we have that one. We have dx. Now, let's see. Um, what can we do next? Um, perhaps, um, I might need another slide for this, but that's okay. No swipes. Hmm? No swipes. No swipes and swipes. Slides, slides. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, let's do a sum of moments about point D for uh, perhaps. Some of moments on object two about point D. So that will make it so I only have uh, these two forces generating a uh, moment. So I'm going to have a BX, and this would be as drawn a positive moment about point D. So, and the moment arm there is 1.5 feet. And by is also, as drawn, is also going to generate a positive moment. So one of those, so by is probably, is probably going to be in the other direction, but that's okay. Um, let's see. Bx is that, and then um, plus by. Um, you know what, I'm actually going to erase this to the right. I think that's a little confusing. And the reason I did that is because there's actually two bx's, and I don't think I can just declare it to the right. There's a b, there's a bx, there's two instances of bx shown, this one and this one. So I don't want to just say they're both to the right or something. Okay, anyway, by is going to generate a uh, positive moment as well as drawn. Three feet equals zero. So then by, this leads to by is one half bx, or just bx over two, or actually negative bx over two. So negative 150 over two, or negative 75 pounds.
pounds. So that means that by is actually pushing down on the right, uh, or sorry, pushing down on object one and pulling up on object two. So we have that one, we have by. So we have this one, and then so um, sum of forces in the y direction on object two. This will give us cy, positive cy, plus, uh, oh sorry, not cy, uh, object two here, plus dy. dy um, minus by minus by equals zero. So dy, this leads to dy equals by, or dy is um, negative 75 pounds. This is by, and this is dy. So we have dy, we have that, we have that, all that's left is cy, and finally sum of forces in object 1 in the y direction, I think I can sneak this in down here, is going to be negative 150 plus cy plus by equals 0, that leads us to uh, cy equals 150 minus by minus by equals uh, 150 minus negative 75 equals 225 pounds is cy, like so. And now we have cy. And that is how we find all of our reactions. Questions on that? Um, could you solve it if it was all one member? How would you solve that? Well, you have to recognize it as a three force member and it's a bunch of weak forms. And it's really stupid. Possible. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, okay. No, I think it, it might only work with the, uh, well, maybe. Uh, okay. What, what else? Anything else? Other questions? Hmm? Okay, mull that for a while. <laughs> huh? Yes, there's also uh, some other shenanigans we could play by treating it as a single object and a zero force member, but I don't like messing with that if I can avoid it. Okay, uh, other questions? All right, moving on. 4.69, oh wait, did you say 4.69 or 4.99? Ugh, okay, sorry, let me, let me fix that just a second. Let me get this one here. Let me, there, derp. Let me just, uh, I'm just going to copy the problem statement from the manual into here, then I'll work on it. Okay, the 45 pound square plate shown is supported by three vertical wires. Determine the tension in each wire. All right, so first I'm gonna do, the first thing I'm going to do is to draw the forces on, uh, on this plate. 
Well, uh, there's an unstated assumption, but uh, I think it's a reasonable assumption to make that this is a uniform plate. It, we're not doing anything really funky here by making it, say, a non-uniform thickness plate. Maybe it's like one inch thick over here and three inches thick over here or tapering or something really weird like that. Or maybe it's made of different materials and it's like the composition changes along its surface. Like we could all, do all sorts of funky things, but let's just, for uh, simplicity, state that uh, it's that... Uh, that uh, it's a homogeneous material. That's a reasonable assumption. So I'm going to have a plate here. I'm going to have a force here acting at the center that will be 45 pounds. So in other words, the weight can be treated as a point force acting through the object's center of mass. Then I'm going to have, so this is going to be very similar to the problem we worked through last time. TA TB and TC All right, so this looks like a fun one Hmm all right, so I'm just going to use a clever uh, sum of moments to solve for this. I could try using a sum of forces in the vertical direction or in the y direction. But that's not going to help me at all. Everything is in the y direction. If I try to sum for, for if I just try to straight up uh, sum forces in the y direction, I'm going to get three unknowns. I'm not going to be very happy. So I'm going to need to do a clever sum of moments. So let us say, uh, well, I see that these are both sort of in this, at, these are all at the same x coordinate, so that might be useful or something. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, all right, let's do the sum of moments about point B. Hmm, let's do, oh, I don't know, let's say the z axis, right? Z direction. Z direction. Like that. That really doesn't mean anything necessarily. That just means, in this case, that just means it obeys the right hand rule. So what do I mean when I, what do I mean when I say this? Uh, about point B in the Z axis. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, we're going to make a little sort of we're taking a z axis here, like a z prime axis almost. Z prime axis, like this. And we are going to see which forces produce moments about this axis going th at, at point B. We can do that. We don't actually have to use this axis, we can use any perpendicular axis we wish. Because again, if an object is to be in equilibrium, it must be, uh, it must. Uh, be in balance must be must have a sum of moments about all points and all axes About all points and about all axes if it if it is not then it will not be in balance So I can sum moments at this point. I can sum moments at this point. I can sum moments about this axis Here the XYZ I can sum moments about an axis from This point all the way diagonal up to point he, uh, up to a point up here that would be very difficult mathematically, but if, it, if for some strange reason that was convenient, I could do that. I can sum moments about any point I like. I can sum moments about the moon if I wish. I don't know why I would do that, but I could um, if I knew the position of the moon to a certain degree of accuracy. But um, I don't know why you would do that, but you could. And you know what? If you uh, sum forces properly, well, actually, no, I should, I should take that back. You cannot sum um, forces on the objects around you about the moon because the moon is moving relative to these objects so you're gonna have problems but uh, anyway uh, so that's but I could if I chose a uh, similarly exotic example I could say how about like uh, the peak of Mount Everest there, there I could there's a similarly exotic point uh, so I could sum moments about there if I wished I don't know if I why I would want to but I could and say this uh, can of uh, soda right here if I sum moments on this object about the peak of Mount Everest in three dimensions finding the, the coordinates and angles it would still be in equilibrium. So, 
as long as we believe in the laws of statics, as long as we believe in the laws of Newton, or as I sometimes like to colorfully say, as long as we still fear Newton's ghost, this will uh, still remain true. So, we can sum moments at any point about any axis that is convenient to us. So I'm going to sum moments uh, through point B about the z-axis. So, using the right-hand rule, well, let's see. Okay, uh, so that takes T and A out of the situation. And exactly. Exactly. That's okay. going to, the question was, that takes this one and this one out of the picture? Yes, that's why I chose that. When I take the moments about uh, this axis, it takes care of TB and TA. There are no moment arms here. So they will not generate any moment about this axis that I've chosen. So then, um, if, I, if I apply the right-hand rule, I will see that about this axis, that this 45-pound force will generate a positive moment, and this TC will generate a negative moment. So I'll have uh, 45 pounds times uh, 10 inches minus uh, TC times 20 inches. All of this is equal to zero. And TC is equal to 45 pounds. Uh, let's see, uh, 45 pounds times 10 over 20. That's one half, or 22.5 pounds. Yes. Where did I get what? Uh, how does, okay, where does this 20 come from? Uh, this is the perpendicular distance from this axis to here. This is the 20 inches here. 22.5 pounds, and this is TC. The tension in chord C. All right, so we have that one. Now, let's see. What could I do next? Um... I'm just going to some moments about the x-axis, not through any point in particular. Or actually, you know what, I could. Yeah, why not? I'll show a point just for consistency. Let's do some moments about point B, about the x-axis. See, um, that will eliminate TB, but it will leave TA. And because it's because TB is right on the x-axis, that will make things a little bit easier. Yes. So it, since B is on the x-axis, couldn't we just call it some moments about the x-axis? We could. Yeah, that's why I was debating uh, whether to actually include that or not. Yes. Yeah, so. Do it with the one you did before because that B is not. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. So anyway, let's see. So I'm just going to use the perpendicular distances to the x-axis, and applying the right-hand rule. Let's see. Uh, this one and this one are going to be negative, and this one is going to be positive, applying the right-hand rule. So I'm going to have TC times a distance of 15 inches times, uh, actually negative, minus TA times a distance of 20 inches. plus 45 pounds times a distance of 10 inches equals zero. And then, uh, let's see, so this is 22.5 pounds. So TA, um, let's see, that is going to be, well, TC is 22.5 times 15 uh, minus 45 times 10, all of this over 20, and negative. So I just put this 22.5 uh, in for TC and solved for TA. And all that will come to some number. Let me get this, 22, let's see, just a second. 22.5 times 15, uh, minus 450 uh, divided by 20 and then times negative 1. I'm getting 5.625 uh, pounds. Does anyone concur? 
5.625 pounds. This is, uh, that would be TA. And if I'm if I am working through any of these and I get or not any of these just this particular problem, and if I'm working through this and I get a negative force in any of these tensions, I'm going to be very concerned because these are ropes and cords, and as we all know, you can't push a rope. Well, I suppose we could make a trivial case that yes, on in a vacuum you could push a rope a very 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 tiny amount, but anything that we're considering. Um, if I got a negative force, I'd be very concerned. We're probably doing something wrong in that case, because uh, yes, the math may say that the math may say that uh, this is carrying an upward force of 10 pounds, but that's probably not going to work. Or sorry, uh, yeah, that that uh, sorry that may sh may show that say this is pushing down on the plate by 20 pounds or something, but in reality we know that's not possible. So something would definitely be wrong there. All right. Then finally, uh, I could do another clever balance of moments, but I'm an incredibly lazy person, and it's summer, so I'm just going to do a sum of forces in the y direction, and have negative 45 pounds uh, plus 22.5 plus 5.625 uh, plus TB equals zero. And TB will equal 45 minus 22.5 minus 5.625, which will equal, let's see, 22.5 minus um, 5.625. I get 16.875 pounds. is equal to TB. Questions on this problem? Generally, yes, yes. The question was, if uh, if this is a plate with vertical tensions, you can if if you see a plate with vertical tensions, you can generally avoid doing cross products and such. Yes, generally. All right. So uh, we got that covered. Now we need to move on to the theory for today. Trusses. Uh, um. Do you want to take a break? I mean, we're only it's only twelve forty-five. Huh? You want to start? Yeah. If anybody needs to use the restroom, go ahead. I mean, you know, whatever. Um, okay, I'd like to cover the theory first, then, because uh, we got we got a full class today, so we got started a little late because of those computer problems. Okay, so we need to learn about trusses. We need to learn about trusses. When you hear the word truss, when you hear the word truss, what do you think? Bridges. Okay, some say so, so bridges. What else? Roof trusses, those are good examples of trusses. Good, what else? Mm -hmm. Trusses. Trusses. <laughs> anyway, um, let's see. So trusses, what is a truss? Simply put, I don't, I don't need to write simply put. Now you can read the book, it'll have a, more, a nice technical definition of a truss, but here is the uh, simple definition. A structure composed of straight members joined by pin joints. This fundamentally is what makes a truss. Everything's a pin joint. 
Not everything. Oh yeah, in a truss, everything is a in a pin joint. Everything is a pin joint in a truss. Yes, you can. Now we can have structures that don't have pin joints. Uh, there are many. For example, a fully welded connection. Though you weld up the the flange and web of a W section, for instance, is a uh, is a fixed support. But uh, is a fixed joint. But in a truss, everything is pin joints. So straight members joined by pin joints. The pins move and trusses don't. Uh, yes, exactly. That's fine. Um, so the joints, in other words, are not able to resist rotation. This, the rotation is resisted by the members themselves, not the joints. So um, assumptions. There are a few assumptions here. Now we could go all crazy writing out assumptions, but I'm going to write some of the big ones. Um, I had a thermodynamics professor in college who uh, was very big on writing out uh, writing out all the assumptions in the in the thermodynamics problem, whether it was like a, you know a, a adiabatic or a, you know isothermal or whatever. Like uh, you'd ha and many times he'd ask you to write out assumptions that on the face of it, just seeing the problem were pretty obvious. But he always took off points if you didn't write the assumption, even if it was a pretty trivial obvious assumption. So. One day when I had a little extra time on the exam, I went a little crazy and just started writing off a huge number of ridiculous assumptions. And he didn't like it when I put down things like, you know, I assume the gravity of the moon is negligible. I assume this is on the Earth. You know, <laughs> things like that. I assume this is not. I assume this is not traveling at relativistic speeds. You know, things like that. But he, he, you know, he didn't. He didn't think it was that funny when I filled up several pages worth of trivial assumptions. <laughs> but anyway. Let's talk about the um, let's talk about the assumptions. The big assumptions are again uh, ideal pins, ideal pin joints. In reality, there is no such thing as a pure uh, a pure pin joint, just like there is no, no such thing as a pure um, just like there is no such thing as a um, a point force, for instance. It's just a, it is just a model. Ideal pin joints. Perfectly straight members. Uh, let's see. Um, forces only applied at joints. So you can have forces on a truss, but they have to be only, but in order to be a true ideal truss, they have to be applied only at the joints, which this is fundamentally impossible. Uh, why? Why is this fundamentally completely impossible? Any idea? Hmm. Internal force would be a great example. Yes, self-weight. Self-weight is a good example. You can't have. Um, I mean, self-weight obviously gener is generated throughout a member. It, every bit of every atom has a, a bit of gravity associated with it. But uh, let's not worry. But you can actually model. It, you can actually design things using tr simple truss assumptions, just by distributing the load as a series of point forces along the member, and that works pretty well. Um, so forces applied at joints. So again, these are. This is a model. Uh, forces applied only at joints. We also have. Let's see. Um, what else? So forces applied only at joints. We can talk about some material properties and other things. Um, oh yes, prismatic members. Prismatic members. What does this mean? Any idea? Uh, so yeah, it, it, it just means a constant cross section. So this it doesn't become thinner. It doesn't have to say it, it's not like a tapered beam or something like that. There are cases uh, where you have beams that are actually like uh, say you see them a lot, especially in like light metal buildings that are manufactured. Like they actually sometimes look like this, like literally shaped like this on this like a column like this. I've seen these before for like manufactured metal buildings. Usually, we don't bother doing that for normal structures because they require a high degree of over of, of high precision engineering. But when you have a manufactured building that is basically made in the factory, you can do that kind of uh, custom engineering for something that if you're going to make a hundred of that type of building. But so, uh, but for anyway, for uh, for our purposes here, we're assuming prismatic members. Uh, let's see. Uh, material. We're not going to work with uh, material that much, but that's okay. We're going to. We, the assumption still applies. We still need to assume homogeneous material. Uh, homogeneous material. Um, let's see. And that should probably do it. That's. Those are the real big assumptions.
But we could get, like I said, we could get really deep into this. And if we sat here long enough, we could come up with assumptions. We could sit, we could sit here all day listing assumptions, like if we wanted to, including things like the gravity of the moon being negligible. But anyway, so this is what a truss is. Why are we talking about it? This is what a truss is. But what's so special about them? Why are we spending two days talking about trusses? Okay. Uh, Okay, the advan there are a few th reasons we want to talk about trusses. One, they are widely used in um, all sorts of design. They're widely used in bridges. They're widely used in roof trusses um, in many different structures. Uh, they are a very efficient uh, structural form. They are a very efficient way to carry and distribute load. They are a very common um, way of carrying load that has been used for many centuries. So, but, but this thing here, when I'm talking about the model, there's something, there's a reason I box this one. A structure composed of straight members joined by pin joints. There's something very special about that, which I want to get at. So, let's look at this. Let's look at this here. So, consider this. Uh, idealized trust member. Consider an idealized truss member here. So I'm going to have an end at A, or just an end one, an end two. I have two ends joined by pin joints. And then they're joined by a straight member. Well, let's call this A and B. So it's an R, it's just a generic, um, it can be at any orientation whatsoever, et cetera, et cetera. Now I'm going to have a two axes here that I want to consider. Now you agree that if something is to be in equilibrium, it must be in equilibrium about all axes, right? About any set of coordinates I wish to choose, this thing has to be in equilibrium, right? So um, let me show you something. I'm going to use a very particular set of coordinates on this because that's going to make my life a lot simpler. I could solve for the equilibrium of, the, of this about the, the global x and y axis, but if I use a local axis, it's going to be a lot easier to uh, jump to the solution here. So I'm going to do that. So let me show you down. Let me show you what I mean. I have my x and my y axis. But I could also draw a shifted axis. Let me draw a, say, an x prime and a y prime, where x prime is along the length of the member. X prime and a y prime, like so. An x prime and a y prime. So. This would be a right angle here, and this would be a right angle here. I'm going to redraw this member um, on the shifted axis. Because again, if a member is to be in equilibrium, it must be in equilibrium about every single axis we choose, including the axis. Um, about a, a parallel and perpendicular to itself. So, and the reason I did this, which we will which we will quickly see, is that when we do this, something magical happens. So let me draw the um, forces on here. Again, this is joint A and B. So let's look at the reactions on here. I'm going to have um, AX prime, BX prime, oh, sorry, that's, uh, no, I, I flubbed there, derp, AY prime, AY prime,
this is going to be bx prime and by prime and I don't I think I'm gonna relabel that because that kind of looks like that's a two-way error I don't like the way this looks a x prime that's better okay so I'm gonna set up some equations of equilibrium based on this one here now Let's see. I could do a sum of moments, or sorry, I could do a sum of forces in the x prime or the y prime direction, but right now that's not going to do me any good because uh, I would have two unknowns for each of these. Well, let's do a, okay, so I again have point A and point B here. So let me do a sum of moments about point A. What do I have? Well, if we look here, this one, this one, and this one all have, um, each one of them has a line of action that passes through point A. The only one that does not is B. B, Y, uh, I guess I could use, I could put it in a variable L if I wanted to. It has length L. That's not going to be important, really. Um, times L equals zero, but this is it. There's nothing else to resist it. So therefore, oh, and by prime, sorry. So therefore, this leads us inextricably to by prime equals zero. Hmm. may not seem like much yet, but it will be. That's pretty powerful. You, may, you, don't, you probably don't realize that yet, but that's pretty powerful. I'll bring it all together, don't worry. Okay, now let me do the opposite. Sum of moments about B is going to be equal to, uh, let's do make this a negative, negative AY prime, also times length L, um, equals zero. Ah, look at that. AY prime is also equal to zero. And then finally, sum of forces in the x prime direction will lead us to, we're not going to get exact values from these, we're just going to get um, relationships. I'm going to have ax prime. Uh, let's say plus bx prime equals zero. And this leads us to ax prime equals negative bx prime. Da, da, da. Isn't that really cool? Okay, again, it doesn't seem like much yet, but let me put it together for you. Okay, so what do we have here? Again, I developed this in terms of generic variables. This applies to all members. Anytime you have a straight member with pins on both ends. So what this is really showing is I have this. I have this AX prime going this way, and a bx prime going this way, they are equal and opposite. Or, I, could just gen I can just generalize this to, instead of having two different variables, why bother, I could just generalize this into saying, you know what, I just have f and f, the same force on both ends. I just have F and F, like so. So, a member with pins on both ends will carry only a single axial force. Axial means along its axis. 
It will not carry any transverse force. It will not carry any moment. It will not carry shear, moment, only axial force. It will not carry any shear or moment, which are things that we'll learn about later. We'll learn about shear and moments uh, later in the week. So, um, again, a member with pins on both ends will carry axial force only. Um, I probably should say only. It will not carry any shear or moment. So, in other words, what this has done, the powerful thing about this is it has reduced every single member to a single unknown. Every member now becomes a single unknown in a truss. In more complicated structures, um, a member can have up to six unknowns. It can have shear and moment and axial force on all ends. Um, I mean, you don't have to worry about when designing, uh, when using a truss, you don't have to worry about moments. Exactly. When you when designing it, well, we will have to use moments. We'll use principles of moments, but only about member ends. We will not have to worry about like internal bending moment and things like that, which we'll we'll look, we'll see that in later in the week. Um, but again, so the powerful thing about trusses is that they generate, is that they exhibit only axial forces. That's what's really powerful about them. Tell me again why it doesn't have a moment. The reason it doesn't have a moment is because math. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So actually, the reason it doesn't have a moment is because I could, like, in a uh, a member with fixed supports, uh, fixed joints to another end, there could be an. You know, I drew a. Uh, I drew the reaction forces here. I would draw a end moment here, like an uh, MB or something like that. But these are pins. They can't have moments on either end. So we have no, we don't have to, if they don't have moments on either end, um, well, we could have a moment internal um, if there was a fixed support here or something like that. But no, with, if, since there's pin supports, we will not have any moment inside the member. We don't have to worry about that. The beautiful thing about trusses is that they're very simple to analyze. We take all of the complexities of structural engineering and reduce a member to a single variable. That is what's really powerful about simple idealized trusses. So let's look at that. Questions on that? Trusses. Are you going to a problem or are you going with more theory? More theory. Okay. okay. Uh, what, so we'll need to be able to analyze trusses. So we know that um, we know that trusses that each member will carry only one force, and I just want to describe the method of joints, and then we'll be working through example problems on there. Uh, method of joints. <clears throat> method of joints. One. Break truss into exploded view. Showing um, forces applied at joints. At joints and reactions. And reactions. To solve for reactions um, on whole truss as rigid body. Actually, you probably should do, you know what, I probably lied. I probably do, I would probably actually do this first step and then this second step. Oh well, it's Monday. Uh, three. Uh, solve for truss internal forces uh, using sum of forces X and sum of forces Y on individual joints. On individual joints. A few notes. Uh, let's see. Draw 
all forces initially as tension. Uh, tension which would be away from joints. In our, um, in our uh, sign convention, tension is positive, is positive, and compression is negative. That looks bad. Compression, negative. Tension is positive, and compression is negative. And that's the method of joints in a nutshell. Then I just need to mention uh, zero force members, and we can get on to the problems after the break. OK, so write that down, and then I will ex briefly explain zero force members. That is the last of the theory, and then we'll be able to get on to uh, um, some example problems. I know this may not make a lot of sense right now, but uh, just with this written out as steps, but we'll go through several examples of solving um, using the method of joints. Just got to get through the theory before I work on the applied. Okay. <coughs> okay. Next, let's do uh, zero force members. This is, this is interesting to know. Zero force members if uh, two collinear members meet at a joint meet at a joint and a third joins them and a third is added This third will have zero force. If no other forces are applied. If no other forces are applied. What do I mean by that? Consider a joint. with two collinear member forces coming into it. A force like this, and a force like this. These are collinear. So, then consider I have a member like this. The force in this member must be zero. Why? Well, the reason this one has to be zero is because if it's not zero, uh, if we think of a, if we think of this in terms of horizontal and vertical, if these these will have these are quote unquote horizontal, they don't need to be horizontal; they can be any direction. What matters is the collinearity. Um, if we think of this in terms of it being horizontal, though, if this the, these do not have any vertical component, right? These have no vertical component in their force. Therefore, if this one had any uh, magnitude at all in there, there would be a vertical force on this joint with nothing to resist it. So, um, again, let me show you what I mean by that. Let me give you some example. So again, if we have a member, if we have something like this, this is just straight members. See, these are these two members are collinear, even though they're not. Um, well, they're poorly drawn at best, but um, violating my uh, my uh, prismatic member assumption. But okay. Uh, so I have these this member here and this member here. They are collinear. Uh, if I consider an axis along these, uh, if this has any force inside of it, then there will be nothing to balance it. Because there will be a axis that is perpendicular to these, that this will have, that this one and this one will not be able to resist, that will not, this one and this one will not have any component of force in that direction. So um, you can read about that in the book. That is the principle of zero force members. So zero force members. That this can be a, this can just be a quick way to solve things on on various problems. 
Um, if you have a um, two collinear members and a third one comes into it, then this one has to be zero. But again, look at this. Watch out for this addendum. If there is another force here, then that no longer applies. So yes. Questions on that? Are we um, assuming all the members are weightless? Uh, yes. Generally, we are assuming all members are weightless, or that the weights that the weight is applied at point forces at the joints. Um, and there is one other property of this, is that the force in this then is going to have to be the same as the force in this. So, these two forces, forces will be equal. So then the question is, if there are zero force members in trusses, why have them? Why would I build a, me why would I build a truss that has zero force members in it? Huh? Security. In case one goes out. In case one goes out. Um, not so much redundancy. It's more about member. It's actually more about something called bracing. Um, on columns, uh, if you have, uh, say, columns, and you apply load on that column, it usually won't. You can't load it up to the point of actually crushing the material. What tends to happen is, it tends to buckle. Something like that, or something like that, bowing out. And that's how columns tend to really fail. So if you brace, if you, if there's no bracing on the column, it will bow out like that, and there's a certain and that there's a certain load there that that requires. But if you brace it in the middle there, then you force it to bend like this shape, which requires a much greater load. So you increase the uh, the capacity of that column by bracing it. So that's one of the primary reasons you would have zero force members. They're not themselves carrying load, but they are bracing the other members that are in compression. However. Um, Another reason is simply because, say, if something like a, um, say, like a bridge truss, well, you may be able to draw one type of loading that there's no force on that member, but if we move, but it, but in real world situations, loads move. Such so as like a tr like a car going across a bridge, the load is at a variety of locations at different points in time. So um, as the load moves, the uh, what was once a zero force member in one loading will not be a zero force member when you load it differently. So uh, anyway, all right. Questions on any of this theory? Okay. Are both of those forces in tension or compression, or does it make a difference? Um, they could be either way. If but they're, but um, the question was, are they both in compression or tension? Well, they're either both going to be in tension, or they're both going to be in tension. Or sorry, they're either both going to be in tension, or they're both going to be in compression. So uh, anyway, all right. Other questions. All right, if, that's, if that is it, uh, we'll go ahead and take a break. We'll come back, and we will work on some examples of solving trusses using the method of joints. <laughs>